um, in Boy Proof, you talk a lot about uh, Egg's dad's uh, kind of sci-fi makeup job. Did you have background knowledge on that, or did you have to kind of look a lot of things up? I did. I did have to look a lot of things up. I, uh, I watched a lot of behind-the-scenes from uh, science fiction and fantasy movies like Lord of the Rings. Their behind-the-scenes on the makeup special effects is fantastic, just FYI. Also, uh, the Star Trek movies and the Star Trek series, if you, uh, if you look at like uh, the behind-the-scenes Deep Space Nine, there's a lot of special effects makeup stuff in there. Uh, I took a lot of books out from the library, um, watched some, uh, some uh, you know, those kind of mini documentaries about stuff like that. Um, I also interviewed a special effects makeup artist. Once I was finished with the book, I, um, I called up a random special effects makeup guy um, who uh, does the special effects on Nip Tuck. He said, well, this could happen, but it you know, wouldn't be exactly this way, or, or you've got the wrong kind of glue here, but that glue is usable, so it's okay. So, you know, or so he was like very helpful in saying, I understand this is fiction, and so it's all the elements are correct, but some of the things are a little kerflui. And so then he told me which the what glue was right or what a better word was and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I sort of feel like even with like Rose sees red, that um, you know, and boy proof. I don't know about special effects makeup, but I didn't want to get bogged down in too much research before I wrote the story. I wanted to write the story from my heart and then go and, like, make sure that, you know, the way that things were unfolding were, you know, believable and true. I did the same thing in The Queen of Cool. It takes place at the Los Angeles Zoo. I did a lot of research there, and I ended up interviewing the, um, the curator uh, of the zoo. And, uh, you know, he same thing. Well... This is not exactly the way we do things here. In a zoo, usually things might be like this, but this is fiction and this is believable. And that's, I think, what's important. Um, in Boy Proof, which is my favorite book of yours, uh, the character Egg, I mean, she changes her name to Egg, she shaves her head, just kind of a very intense dedication to being her favorite heroine in the sci-fi movie. Um, what's the most you know, out there intense thing you've done for a, a passion or an interest like that? Well, you already know the answer to that. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I uh, really like Star Wars a lot. And uh, so I actually, when uh, Star Wars Episode One came out, I lived in a tent on Hollywood Boulevard for six weeks to wait for tickets to go to the midnight showing. That is pretty intense. Yeah, that's pretty intense. And I mean, I used to wear Princess Leia, you know, but, but uh, not anymore. Um, a lot of authors talk about how their work is very autobiographical, and I just wondered, when writing Beige, I mean, you were in a band, you are a musician, was it difficult to write from the perspective of someone who has no interest in music, doesn't understand it at all, kind of says that she likes boy bands and, like, background music? You know, it's interesting, because I think that the thing about music and music books is that music profoundly influences us, and it changes our lives. I mean, you know, the way that punk rock galvanizes people, you know, music starts revolutions and stuff like that. I think that the absence of music is just as profound on someone as music galvanizing them. And here I was living in Los Angeles, and I'm an indie rock girl, but at the time I was working at Epitaph Records, which is a punk rock place. Um, everybody around me was punk rock, punk rock, punk rock. And I felt like an outsider to the scene. So rather than write a book about punk rock from an insider's point of view, I wanted to write it from someone who's observing the scene from the outside and yet had sort of a front row seat. So... Um, I think that while it was difficult, because I certainly love and music and I'm inspired by it, it was easier to get to the heart of it through the absence of music because it showed the blossoming of someone's understanding of music, and I think that that's what Beige is really about. How'd you come up? I saw that, um, I thought it was really cool how each um, chapter in Beige has a different um, kind of punk rock song title. How did you come up with those titles, or those songs? I uh, emailed every single person that I know uh, 
uh, it, that loves punk rock music, every single person that I know, and I um, asked them to come up with a list of the 10 most essential punk rock songs that they would give someone to listen to, and the list was wildly different from everyone. Some There were a lot of crossover songs, um, uh, but the, the list was very, very different, because what some people think is punk rock is completely different. That's the great thing about punk, you know, uh, uh, the most punk person that ever was a punk could say, you know, Handel's Messiah is punk, you know what I mean? Like, you just don't know. So uh, I polled everybody, and then I sort of took a lot of the crossover songs and made that into sort of a big... Um, a big list, and that was the that was the chapter titles. And then what I tried to do is I also tried to pick songs from those lists that uh, where the song would have something to do with the sort of heart of each chapter, so that you know you sort of got a tip as to you know like a good chapter title does gives you a sort of tip to what's coming up. So that was that, and uh, I did have uh, I can send you the link if you want. I did have a blog that I put up for a while called uh, Is Beige Punk. Dot mm -hmm. blogspot dot com where I had a lot of the people that I polled share their punk rock uh, lists so you could listen to them. Thank you. Um, what was the process yes. like, kind of from you know completing your first book to actually getting? I wrote my first book. It was called Chloe's Jam, and then it's interesting because uh, Chloe's Jam in a way, is a very similar story to Beige. It's different. In Chloe's Jam, the girl was a violinist, and then she meets a punk rock girl who's got a famous punk rock brother, and then she realizes that music is bigger than just classical music and embraces punk and embraces music. It's a similar story, so it was nice to be able to like sort of reinvent that book later on. Um, and then I wrote a book called Walking Away from Wonderland, and then I wrote a book called Grandma's Gloves, which is a picture book, which actually I ended up selling after Beige and is coming out this August as well. So, uh, and then I wrote Boy Proof. So it was a long process, and Grandma's Gloves, which was the um, picture book, actually opened up some doors for me. Um, Liz Bicknell at Candlewick Press, she had read it, loved it, wanted to buy it, couldn't buy it because picture books weren't very popular then, and it's a very sad dead grandma picture book, even though it's great. <laughs> it's a sad book. And um, so she uh, so she asked me to send her my uh, my novel. So I sent her, you know, Chloe's Jam, and I sent her Walking Away from Wonderland, and she was like, no, no, no. And then I went to a Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators writing retreat, and um, she was there, and I read 10 pages from Boy Proof, and she said, she pulled me aside, and she said, um, I know what the problem is. I'm not the right editor for you. Send me Boy Proof, and I'll walk it to Kara LaRoe's desk, who was working at Candlewick at the time, and uh, I think you're, I think she's your editor. And um, that's what I did. And so I guess the thing is, is, I mean, it took like seven years from the time I got serious to the time that I sold my first book. And I think the thing that I learned was that sometimes you can make great friends with an editor, but it doesn't mean that they're ever going to buy your book. And it just might not be a good fit. And uh, so for me, I learned patience. And uh, it was a long journey. And that, you know, Grandma's Gloves, which she didn't buy, I didn't sell until, you know, three years after that, you know. But it, and, you know, nothing is useless and everything is a learning experience and all that. Yeah. Other advice for an inspiring young adult author? Well, yeah, obviously, read, read, read. Uh, you know, read everything. Uh, write as much as you can. Uh, learn to put your good ears on. I think one of the problems that we all have as writers is that it's very, very hard to take critiques and it's very, very hard to have people read your work. And so I'm always trying to practice putting on my best ears, you know, like, why is that person having an emotional hangnail at that particular point? Why aren't they understanding my brilliance, you know, <laughs> like, and uh, what can I do to actually serve the book better? I sort of have told myself that uh, if I was only ever going to write one book in my entire life, then I'd better be precious about every single word and every single thing that goes in that book, and damn everyone else. But if you're really a writer worth your salt, then all your ideas keep. You can use every part of the buffalo. You can use it in a later book. You can use it in another book. Just do your work. Put your preciousness away. Put your good ears on and uh, roll up your sleeves. So... I think it's learning how to listen. 
That's the important thing.